Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Bauer, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about canine ACL disease. Uh, the ACL is uh, the abbreviation for the anterior cruciate ligament. It is the most common injury that we see in veterinary orthopedics. It's a very common injury in humans as well. The, 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 the pathology of how that happens is, is actually completely different, though, between humans and dogs, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. As far as terminology goes, in dogs, that ligament is really called the cranial cruciate ligament, but everyone knows it as the ACL, which is human terminology, so we will refer to it as the ACL within our website and throughout this uh, little presentation. Now, the first thing I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about uh, joint anatomy, and I have a number of ways to illustrate that. This is uh, a plastic model showing the anatomy uh, with the femur above, tibia below, uh, the kneecap or patella sits at the front of the femur, and the top of the tibia is the tibial plateau. Inside the joint we'll see the ACL and the medial and lateral meniscus, which you can't see really well on this model. So I'll move to a model that I've removed some of the structures so we can see that more easily. So same orientation on the bone. And then within the joint, we see in the center, with my finger pushing on it, we see in the center the ACL. In real life, the ACL's much bigger than that, but on the model, it, it shows up as a relatively underrepresentative size. Uh, and then at the top of the tibial plateau, are two shock absorbers, and each one is called a meniscus. Uh, and so that's the pertinent anatomy of the canine stifle joint on the uh, plastic model. I also have an artist illustration that I'd like to demonstrate as well. So here we have a, a artist illustration, which again, the femur is above the joint, tibia below the joint, kneecap at the top of the joint, the top of the tibia is the tibial plateau uh, shown with the blue line, and in dogs it's downward, backward, sloping, and then the ACL is, is labeled uh, on that illustration. So let me show you a radiographic illustration as well with, again, the femur above the joint, tibia below the joint, uh, kneecap or patella at the front of the joint, and the sloping tibial plateau. We actually cannot see the ACL on an x-ray, uh, but we'll talk about that more when we get to the part of diagnosis. So that's a brief overview of canine joint anatomy. And uh, with that in mind, I'd like to, to, to wrestle around a little bit of the question on everyone's mind, which is why so many dogs are tearing their ACLs. I know you as a pet owner want to know that. Mike Bauer is a pet owner. I'd like to know that. Uh, and certainly as a veterinary surgeon, I'd like to know that, but the answer is fairly elusive. And we've tried to look at, at, at all the variables at breed, age, gender, weight, conformation, but we've not come up with a specific answer on, on, on why dogs are tearing their ACLs. And, and again, it's the most com common problem we see. Uh, we do think that there is one common denominator, and it's biomechanical stress. Uh, and the biomechanical stress is related to the anatomy. Uh, and so I'm going to illustrate that a number of different ways. So on this side of my scrubs, I have embroidered a, a human knee. And again, the bone above is the femur. The bone below is the tibia. The ACL connects the two, uh, and the top of the tibia is illustrated with the red line, uh, which is relatively level. On the human side, uh, because of the tibial plateau, the femur rests on a relatively level surface. The way that the ACL is stressed is if the tibia thrusts forward, such as if a football player hits from behind. On the other side of my pants, I have embroidered a canine knee. Again, femur above, tibia below, ACL connecting the two. The difference is that the tibial plateau in the dog slopes down and back. Uh, weight bearing causes a downward-backward sliding, which causes 
chronic stressing of the ACL. And that same type of movement, I also will illustrate for you with a set of x-rays. So if we look at uh, this next x-ray, it is uh, in the same orientation as the previous. And what we see happen during weight bearing is dogs slide down and back on their sloping tibial plateau. And that downward backward sliding motion is what's responsible for this chronic biomechanical wear and tear on the joint. And so we actually think why dogs tear their ACLs is because they're under chronic biomechanical stress and they actually don't just tear in two and that happens often in humans. We go skiing and go over the top of our skis and we tear our ACL into two pieces. In dogs, usually it is a gradual little by little type of wear and tear. And I have uh, four little clips of arthroscopic images uh, that illustrate that. These are, these are four different patients, but in my opinion, it illustrates well what happens uh, with this gradual biomechanical wear and tear. The first video is a normal ACL, and we see nice tight bundles of fibers. But over time, with biomechanical stress, the ligament becomes discolored, the fibers become loose, the ligament becomes soft, uh, as we see probing it here in this illustration, in this video. That gradually leads to actual fibers that tear, uh, as we see in this patient that has a clear-cut partial ACL tear. And that tearing gradually worsens until we see a full ACL tear, and it almost looks like a mop head that's been pulled and yanked apart. So it's in a lot of fibers, large fibers, small fibers, but, but that's the end result of this biomechanical uh, wear and tear. So I'd like to summarize that again using the x-ray illustration uh, with the femur sliding down and back and down and back. And that motion and that biomechanical problem that we see uh, it dictates a lot of things. It, it, it tells us, maybe in an oversimplified way, but it tells us why so many dogs are tearing their ACL. Um, it dictates the fact that once dogs start to tear their ACLs, they're virtually always progressive. It dictates that dogs with ACL tears that aren't repaired never do well because as they bear weight, their knee does that chronic shifting motion and it dictates how we fix canine ACL tears and we'll talk about that in the upcoming section. So the clinical signs in dogs that uh, tear their ACLs are quite variable. Uh, the uh, lameness level is variable, uh, the onset is variable. Uh, some dogs that tear their ACL will be completely non-weight bearing. Other dogs will have intermittent but slowly worsening lamenesses, maybe to start with after exercise and then being more and more persistent. I have a, a video of a dog with a torn ACL that uh, has a fairly moderate uh, lameness and uh, this guy has a right rear lameness and barely bearing weight, uh, we see as, as uh, as they hobble down the hallway. So the, that is a fairly typical lameness in dogs with ACL tears, but again, it really varies. We see some that are only subtly lame when they come in the, in the, into the office, but at home after they chase the ball, they hold their leg up, and so it's quite a big variability. As far as the onset goes, uh, most dogs, it comes on more gradually over weeks or months. Not always. Sometimes dogs are relatively normal and then they become acutely non-weight-bearing lame. So a lot of variability in that as well. And one of the other clinical signs that you'll see in, in, your, in your dog at home and we see is the inability to sit straight and square. So I ha have a little video of that, uh, of a dog that is unable to sit straight and square, which is very common in dogs that have any degree of ACL pathology or tearing. And so this is a video uh, that you'll see during the sit uh, pattern uh, is very uncomfortable. She's very uncomfortable as she sits. She can't quite get down and then as she plops down, she puts her legs out to the side. And that is typical 
uh, of a dog with uh, ACL problems. So, so those are some of the main clinical signs. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to move ahead and talk about how we make the diagnosis. So the diagnosis uh, in dogs with ACL tears is based on a variety of factors. Certainly clinical signs is one, and certainly dogs that sit in this kind of sideways sit pattern, uh, it helps in the diagnosis. And when I see a dog in the waiting room that sits like this, even if they're asked to sit for a treat and they're uncomfortable as they sit down, it's, it's, it's high on my list of possible problems. But physical exam becomes important as well. And so uh, during the examination, we certainly palpate the knee, feel the knee, and we feel it, for one, for thickening. And the majority of dogs that tear their ACLs develop this slowly increasing firm bulge on the inner part of their knee, and we call that medial buttress. So we find that typically on physical exam when we feel one knee compared to the other. The other part of physical examination that we use to, to, to determine whether a dog has torn their ACL or not is instability. And it's caused a lot of controversy and confusion, the instability test. There's really two ways to test for instability. One is to grab the knee and shift it back and forth, and that's called cranial drawer, uh, like opening a drawer. Uh, and uh, we've used that as the gold standard for determining if a dog has an ACL tear for years, but it's very inaccurate. Um, we know that more and more as time goes on. Nearly 50% of dogs that I see with ACL tears do not have cranial drawer. And they don't have cranial drawer because either they're in some phase of tearing and not torn all the way yet, or they've torn very gradually over many, many months and developed all this scar tissue around their joint, so their joint's not really unstable, even though they are very, very lame. And so the cranial drawer test, uh, instability test, sometimes is misunderstood. Uh, but those are the things that we typically do on physical examination to determine if we think a patient has an ACL tear. The other thing that is helpful, but not definitive, uh, is to take an x-ray or a radiograph. And I have an illustration of that here. So on this x-ray, uh, again, same orientation of all the other illustrations, uh, we see some changes that are suggestive of an ACL tear, but not definitively diagnostic of. Again, you cannot see the ACL on an x-ray, but when dogs tear their ACLs, they typically develop fibrous tissue and fluid inside of their joint. And that shows up as a big gray blob within the center of their joint. So that's suggestive of an ACL tear. The other thing that's suggestive in this case is the femur is slid slightly back down on the tibial plateau. Now in the previous illustration where we showed the femur sliding all the way off of the tibial plateau, that one is definitive. When you see that x-ray, you know they have a full complete ACL tear, but we don't always see that on an x-ray. Um, and then the other thing that we see on x-ray uh, is a bone spur on the end of the kneecap, and we commonly see that. That's not causing a problem, but it's a sign that there's chronic inflammation in the joint and by far the most common reason for a dog to have chronic inflammation in their joint is ACL pathology. So, so we certainly use x-rays as part of the, the diagnostic approach. But the ultimate diagnosis should virtually always be made with an arthroscopic examination. This is what an arthroscopic setup looks like. There's a scope that's inserted into the joint through a small poke hole and then that's projected onto the TV monitor. So that's the arthroscopic setup. Let me show you a couple arthroscopic videos. Uh, this is a normal joint. So this is an arthroscopic video of a normal joint. We're probing the ligament. You can see the nice little blood vessels within the ligament. See how big it is? That's the base of it, a nice big broad base as it attaches uh, to the tibial plateau. Uh, you can see the meniscus on each side, and that's the posterior ligament that we're probing now. Uh, and again, the ACL with its nice broad base attaching across the tibial plateau. So this is normal, and next I'll show you a video of the full tear, 
And so once again, uh, the fibers have all been torn apart. Uh, there's large fibers, small fibers, but it very much resembles a mop head that has just been torn apart. So that is the way that the definitive diagnosis for an ACL tear is made. Uh, and, and once we've made that diagnosis, then we move ahead to definitive treatment, uh, which leads us to treatment options. So treatment options for dogs with ACL tears are really broken down into two large categories. One category is a replacement technique. And we've done replacement techniques for decades and decades. In fact, when I was a senior in veterinary school 31 years ago, replacement techniques were what we were using. In humans, some form of replacement is the gold standard, but humans have level tibial plateaus. Uh, in dogs, for the most part, the replacement techniques uh, are fading and, and they're being replaced with a technique that changes the biomechanics in the joint instead of an attempt to replace the ligament. The problem with the ligament replacement is that chronic biomechanical stress that we think tore the ACL causes the replacement technique to loosen. Um, there's one replacement technique that, uh, that some surgeons are doing now, and it's called the tightrope technique. We've not done a lot, but we've done a handful, and they've not worked out really well in our hands. Uh, but I have an illustration of, of that technique. The way the technique works is a bone tunnel is made through the tibia, and a bone tunnel is made through the femur. Then this very tough material uh, is laced through those bone tunnels, crosses on the outside of the joint in the same orientation uh, as the ACL. Of course, the ACL really lives in the middle of the joint, not on the outside of the joint. Uh, and then the, the material is anchored with uh, these stainless steel buttons. Again, the problem with the replacement techniques is we find that the bone tunnels widen over time as the material wears, they become rounded, which makes things come loose. Uh, the, the metal buttons, if there's any soft tissue caught under them, uh, it necroses. And so what's tight at surgery isn't tight two weeks later. And we've even seen the buttons actually subside down into the bone uh, as the bone undergoes some degree of pressure necrosis again resulting in instability and looseness uh, following the procedure. So, so that's, that's the problem uh, with the replacement techniques and why many of us have abandoned them. Uh, and we've abandoned them in favor of, of changing the biomechanics. And, and the, there's two competing techniques for that. Uh, one is called a tibial tuberosity advancement or TTA and that's what is shown on this illustration. Uh, and it involves a bone cut and a plate that changes the orientation of the patella tendon. Uh, here at CCO, we've done hundreds of TTAs, um, but we've had better luck in our hands with the other procedure that changes the biomechanics called the TPLO. Uh, and in the next section, I'll discuss the TPLO at length. Uh, and uh, we'll move to that.